I'm Tom Pappert here with Julian Raven, the Trump painting artist. You may have seen him a couple weeks ago. You may have seen him online. And for those who don't know, he's got a very interesting backstory. But first, let's let's talk about Cleveland. What did you think of Cleveland? Uh, I thought it was incredible. I mean, I, as we discussed when I met you there, Tom, it was a life changing experience for me. And it was such a broad experience. You know, I went from very important highfalutin meetings in the morning with the New York delegation and all the New York brass. And I got to meet really, really important people. I got to speak to Newt Gingrich and ask him a question in, in one of the uh, interactions we had. So that was really important. Then down with the middle of the day was all, you know, protests and interacting with people on a whole different level. And then the evening then was a whole different show after, you know, uh, it was the convention. So it was a whole different gig altogether. So um, really a, a dramatic set of different experiences every day for me. So very exciting. And it was life changing. I'll never be the same again. And now you are the Trump painting artist. And tell us one more time, what is the official name of your ma I'm going to call it a masterpiece. What's the name of your masterpiece? It's, it, it's called Unafraid and Unashamed unafraid and unashamed and tell me a little bit of your inspiration for creating it when it came to when the idea came to you and how it came to fruition well last year you know with donald trump entering the race i was very excited we were excited up here in new york state especially upstate new york when donald trump expressed an interest to run as governor a few years ago we live in a very depressed region it's very beautiful um, years ago there was huge industry in upstate new york but in the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, we've experienced a massive downturn. So we're looking for great economic leadership here in New York State. So Donald Trump was the answer. That didn't happen. And then when June 16th came about last year and Donald Trump entered the race, I was like, wow, this is fantastic. This is what we've been waiting for. Bigger and better than New York State. This is now for the country. Um, you know, as an artist, I was busy working on other projects. And about July 9th, it was, I had sat down at my computer. I was listening to Donald Trump speak and um, looking at a photo of his online. It was this sort of stare photograph that he has out there, this look. And as I'm looking at it, listening to his words, I have the words sort of ticker tape across my mind, unafraid and unashamed. And at that moment, I have an image in my mind, a picture or a vision, however you want to say it, um, of, a, of a, 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 a bald eagle swooping down to catch a falling American flag. It was as if a flagpole was falling, the flag was falling. And right in that last minute, the, the eagle swoops in and rescues the flag. And you know, I, I didn't pay it too much mind. I was busy working on other projects as an artist. Um, but that image was there, a face, an eagle, and a flag. And that's how it was for about three or four weeks. And then the next stage happened. Now, tell me a little bit about that process when you were meditating on the painting because I've seen the full picture and I think it depicts somewhat of a timeline. So tell me about how, how things continued along that journey. I had this internal pressure growing inside of me. Daily I would be thinking on the face, the eagle, the flag. You know, how would this painting come about? What would be the composition? How would I make it so there would be a, a bold portrait but at the same time convey this vision, this, this story that was unfolding? And, um, you know, so I was constantly in this place, but the pressure to do it increased daily and about three or four weeks into it. And I remember, remember it was July 9th when I started. I was into the beginning of August and I was sitting at my computer at home working now for the first time on a bald eagle. I said, I've got to find an eagle with the right expression, an eagle that's grabbing this flag, that's rescuing the flag. And I thought of an eagle catching a fish, you know, when they swoop down and grab a fish and this really powerful event that takes place when an, when an eagle hunts. And um, I thought, wow, I found this image. I had found it on July 9th and I was developing it. I couldn't find a screaming eagle that was fishing at the same time. And so I was creating an eagle and my young daughter, Victoria, who's with me tonight, she comes into my room behind me and she looks at the screen and she says, Dad, what are you doing? Are you going to build a sculpture of an eagle? And I said, no, sweetheart, uh, blah, 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 blah. And then I said, painting. And she sort of was like, oh, whatever, and left the room. She does an about turn, walks back into my office and says, Dad, why don't you paint a painting of the eagle, give it to Donald Trump, so when he becomes president, he can hang it in the White House. Now, my daughter knew nothing of what I was thinking for the last three to four weeks. Nobody did. It was an internal 
meditation. I do most of my work upstairs. I call it my upper, upstairs studio inside my head. I have hundreds of pieces of work going on at the same time, usually. And this was just another piece at that time. But when my daughter said this, I turned and I looked at her and I was like, wow, where did you get that from? And stood there staring at her, 13 year old at the time, shrugged her shoulders, walked out the door. She didn't, she didn't say anything more. To me, it was a confirmation that, my goodness, you better get on and paint this painting. So I continued to work on it. But what was amazing was the next morning when I turned on the news, I was like, let me see what Donald Trump is saying today. I go to CNN and there on their video segments, there was a starting segment for the day very early in the morning, 8, 9 a.m. And it said, I had a visitor today. And that morning, Donald Trump had given an interview and he had a visitor. And there was a segment and I clicked on it and said, well, let's see what this is about. I press play on this video and there on the screen is, the, is a still shot leading into this video segment. And it's Donald Trump standing in his office like this with a bald eagle perched on his arm. Uh, I don't know if you've seen. <laughs> Have you seen that picture, Tom? Yes, yes. I, I tell you, listen, I froze staring at the screen. My first impression was it was a photo montage because I was like, someone is playing a trick on me because I've been meditating on this face and this bird and flag for a month nearly. My daughter out of nowhere says, Dad, why don't you paint a painting of the eagle? Give it to Donald Trump so when he becomes president, he can hang it in the White House. And the very next morning, wow, Donald Trump standing in his office in Trump Tower with a bald eagle perched on his arm. And then the video rolls, and there he is sitting at his desk with the bald eagle sitting on his desk. Now, to me as somebody who is, you know, as a Christian, as a believer, you know, I'm curious. I want to know what God's will is, what's God, what is God doing? And to me, that was a, a multiple level of, comf of confirmation for me to say, you need to paint this painting. This is, this is major. This is serious. I got such a conviction to paint this painting from that moment. It literally made me nearly fall off my chair. I could not believe my eyes, to be honest with you. I stared at the screen. I was like, what is that? What am I seeing? And that led me within an hour's time. I was down in my studio where I am right now, building this huge seven by 15 foot frame. That's the size of the actual painting. The finished frame dimensions with the decorative frame are eight by 16 feet. And so I worked on this frame, stretched the canvas, and I began painting, not even having more than just a face, an eagle, and a, fr and a, and a flag. I had nothing worked out. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I had to start painting unafraid and unashamed. And I did, and I didn't stop for nearly 600 hours, morning, noon, and night. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't even rest. I lay there in bed like with this picture in my head. My wife's like, are you all right, sweetie? I'd get up at ungodly hours. I was in my studio. I'm sleeping in here. I mean, I could not be normal. I couldn't stop this process. It radically impacted me and it changed my life for those nearly 600 hours. I mean, it was eight weeks solid, including building the frame, morning, noon, and night. And it, it, was, it, was, it was unstoppable. So that is the story of the inspiration of the painting. And uh, now I'd like to present it to you because it's behind me, behind that curtain. And this is the full version. We have before seen a smaller version, but this is the original, the masterpiece, the one-of-a-kind creation. So I don't know, you can see it pretty much in the, in the frame there over my shoulder. And um, we'll take a little look at it. Like I said, it's eight feet tall and it's finished dimensions. It's actually 93 inches, it's three inches off, and then it's like three inches off, 16 feet long. It's so much easier to say eight by 16 feet. And um, I built a wall for it. And, uh, uh, it's a 10 foot by 16 foot wall. We set up the lights and the flag because we've been showing it, obviously. So as I've traveled with it, that's how I've displayed the painting. Okay, and it looks like it tells a story. Can you tell me a little bit about the story that the painting tells? I remember you mentioning it was a timeline, a, a continuum, to, is, was the word you used. Correct. Well, come with me, and uh, I'll give you a little tour. It's, it's a symbolic painting. As I painted it, like I explained before, 
I didn't know what I was doing. In other words, I hadn't planned, other than this face, the flag, and a, an eagle, I didn't know what was going on other than the basic gist of the composition was this eagle representing the spirit, the spirit of the land, the spirit of the people, the spirit of God even, that this symbolic creature would, would rescue this nation, which was obviously symbolized by the flag. So I started with that, but as you can see, there's far more detail in it. And the flag, as I started painting it, it, it began to take on this very long shape. It was very, very long. And as I developed it, the original idea of the falling flag on the flagpole was the flag was attached or grounded to the device that secures it. In other words, a flag is attached to the flagpole. It's like its anchor, its foundation. And so as I developed it, the pole disappeared and the flag, as you can see, this flag is back to front. Um, it's cut off. The ropes are cut off here at where would be our founding. And these then become some of the main symbols in the, in the painting. And, you know, before I go into explaining what they are, it's nice for people to try to work out what they are. But this, for example, is a, it's a historic symbol. And um, what it is, is it's one coil of the Gadsden snake uh, from the Don't Tread on Me flag from 1776. As you can see, it's one coil. You can see the the mouth like here. It's a cut off rope, but it's also a snake. Can you see that, Tom? I can. That's very clever. I, I did not put that together when I was standing in Cleveland. I, I thank you for explaining that to our viewers. Well, that's that's so this then is one of the founding values from what I see as a newborn citizen of, of our great nation is the spirit of independence that America gave birth to in the world, the spirit of these men who stood up with such courage against the forces of tyranny coming from the United Kingdom under King George. And they said, no, no more, that's enough. And that's embodied here in this painting, in this symbol, this don't tread on me symbol, which was such a major symbol of the Civil War, uh, the Revolutionary War. And so that to me is very important. So we have this, and you can see it's upside down and it's like the snake is dead. It's cut off. The rope's cut off and the snake's upside down in like the position, like we've lost that spirit, not completely, because it burns still in the hearts of many, many Americans across this country. But it's as if we've lost that founding value of independence as our nation is being dragged into a globalist mentality. So that's one of the founding values here. And then down here, this other rope that you can see, it's the ancient Christian symbol of the fish or ichthys. If, and I, again, I don't make it that obvious, but it's obvious. I, I even painted a, the squashed end of a cutoff rope flattened out like a fishtail, as you can see here. So, so this is a, 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 the, the Christian symbol, again, of our founding values, our Judeo-Christian principles, our moral values that are critical to the greatness of the United States of America. So these two elements that attach the nation to the flagpole are cut off, as you can see, the severed and was severed, and the flag as a result is sort of just billowing and floating in space. Again, symbolic of sort of like losing your moorings and just blowing around in the wind. That's what's going on. Now, it, the story, the, the symbolism as I was painting it continued, even down to, for example, if you can focus right here, Victoria, this is the torn flag. Can you see this right here? That's that's. I can. I can see the tears, and I can see what appears to be some uh, some some texture as well. Right. If you look at this symbol right there, it's that one right there. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. I can see it. What is that? Oh, it's a child. It is. It's a baby, and it's one of the tears in the fabric of the flag. You see, this is the torn, fading, falling flag, and this is one of the tears in the fabric the taking of babies, unborn babies in the womb, one of the great causes of our decline as a great nation. Um, so it's one of the symbols in this torn, the, 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 the edges are frayed, that there's a tear here, the, the tension in our nation, you know, the civil war that we've had and 
are people, there's always a lot of hostility. People are always this tension before revolution or civil. I mean, it's, it's an unfortunate reality, but at the further we drift from our values, people get more frustrated and more angry. And so there's this tension. So the different symbols then, even down here, we have the, you can see this part right here. Can you see that? Yes, we the people, is that correct? Correct, yeah, but it's faded. It's the faded we the people. Our voice is fading. The people's voice is fading. The idea, the genius of America in those three words, we the people, is being taken away. The power of that is being sapped out of it because, you know, we've been turned into a country where government is the answer and big government is the answer. Whereas, no, the genius of America is in those three words, we the people. Now, tell me a little bit about the restoration that happens later on in the painting. The flag continues, again, like a continuum of time. This is a sort of long, stretched out flag. Once the flag comes under the wing of the eagle, it, it gets healed. In other words, all the tears disappear, the roughness, the rips, all of it disappears. And you get like a silky texture come out from under the wing of the eagle. So once it's under this, this stage we're going through here, right up to the second stage where you actually, you know, back over there, you could see the feathers, like fingers were actually catching the rope. I don't know, can you see that part right there? Yes, I can see that it's uh, intertwined. Right, so it's sort of catching the, the flag on one end. At the same time, this was this snatching part of the flag right here, this, this grabbing, uh, which is quite an aggressive gesture. You know, when, the, when these eagles pounce on these fish, out of nowhere, they, they, you know, can you imagine this experience I mean, in this massive bird with these huge talons just set upon this fish. And sometimes those fish are massive, much bigger than the bird itself. Right. Masses you know, manages to wrestle it out of the water. So very powerful, uh, that, that arresting or that snatching of the fish. So that's what's happening here. So this massive bird, I wanted to pay an enormous bird. I think it's about eight feet, nearly nine feet in tip to tip of the wings so you could really get a sense of this enormous bird grabbing the flag and as the flag was falling it's snatching the flag rescuing it and as it's being now under the under the shadow of the wings which is technically this blue here is the shadow being cast in the composition by the rising white sun in the east that light is casting on the back of the of the eagle causing a shadow that's falling on the back of Donald Trump, symbolizing that God, Donald Trump is under the, the shadow of divine pro providence, that he is under the hand of this guiding force over history and the history of our nation. And so we have this, this, this moment where we have new stripes being pulled down from heaven, but it's coming down and out of Donald Trump at the same time catching the flag as it's falling so this sort of the the falling flag is being rescued and at the same time the make america great again the recreation of the restoration is happening with new stripes the ink as it's a shadow this way is an ink coming this way where we're seeing coming again out of trump the materials for a fresh flag for new stripes new stars and new ink for a restored flag and that again is symbolizing the make america great again because if you think about it how do you paint a picture of make the words make america great again it's a very difficult word picture to paint in, a, in an image so to me this was that process making america great again this grabbing once again of our nation that's falling this uh, aggressive grass it's like someone driving a car off a cliff you don't politely ask them to drive back on the road, please. You grab the wheel and you pull the car out of its, its, its course into destruction. You pull it into, you know, obviously to salvation, basically. So that's what's happening here. So out of this man, this instrument, the spirit then is pulling, cre recreating and rescuing the falling flag all simultaneously. And as a continuum, like a timeline, we are in this stage of the continuum right here. It continues on and its very beginning is over there. So that gives a sense of that it's history that we're part of here. And this is where we are. This is what's taking place in our nation right now. And it really drives home the idea that Donald Trump, you, you call him an instrument. He calls himself a messenger. You know, he's, this is, 
a, a larger movement being expressed through Donald Trump. And I think, if I understand correctly, your painting does an excellent job of explaining that. Well, I believe that. I absolutely believe it, that it's the hand of providence on his life. But he doesn't even know about it. He may not even have a consciousness of it. It's just his age, his the trajectory of his life, being prepared for this time in history. Those things are what's being captured here. And the spirit that Trump, you see, Trump is, in the painting, Trump is silent. He's thinking. He's got the look. He's got the, the ears are turning. But the bird is screaming. The bird has got the scream. It's that alarm. It's that call. And that's what's happening. So the bird is, it's like what's going on in his head is being expressed on the screen right here. And that's really something else. I, I Honestly, I've never seen anything quite like it. And you say it took you over 600 hours to complete this. Yep, it's approximately, I mean, I worked it out day by day. And, uh, and it's not because I just painted it once and got it right. It's because I painted it over and over again. This bird, this bird took me weeks to paint. I couldn't get it right. And not that it was bad. My wife would come in and say, oh, sweetie, that looks great. And I said, yeah, but it's not right. And I would spend a whole week on this part of the wing, and then I'd paint over it, and I'd paint it out, and I'd do it again on the bird, the head of the bird. Since I couldn't find a screaming eagle that was coming out of the water, I created the bird, making it look right. It was so difficult. It was the hardest thing I did in my life, and that's why it took me. It was ad nauseum. It was this continual drive to get it. It was until it looked right. Competence is something that can be easily admired, easily worshipped, and this is truly some of the most competent painting I've ever seen. Now, tell me, what's the reception been like? I know you were featured during part of the RNC. I know from your website you've been featured in art shows in various places. Tell me a little bit about what, like the about what the public res public's response has been to Unafraid and Unashamed. They're not sure. A lot of people don't understand the language of art, and it's. You know, it takes an explanation. So many people are like, wow, when they, when they get it, the explanation, my goodness, I didn't realize that's what I was looking at. Um, the, the liberal art world is hostile towards, obviously, Donald Trump. I mean, the art show, one of them that it just came out of a major art show in Los Angeles about four, a month ago at Politicon in Pasadena, where the painting was on show with a host of very negative anti-Trump works like the like it was the, the the it was the pinnacle of the political art world and um they saw my work the originator of the obama painting hope and change who is a hardcore leftist he saw my work and he said i even though i have i'm completely on the other side of the fence i see vision and i see hope in your work and i want it in my show so that was a, that was a real good connection to have a bridge and that's again the power of art to have a bridge with somebody on the other side of the fence. So that video shows, I mean, the, the anti-Trump work, it was just, it was, it was everywhere. And it was negative and it was, it was a reflection that people didn't have anything better to offer. You know, I came with a vision and it silenced people. It, it, people didn't know what to say. They couldn't insult the painting because the execution was there. And it's, you know, they, they, they had to say, even in, in, in Cleveland, it was great. I had so many people. I had Black Lives Matter folks. I had Bernie supporters. I had people that were opposed to Trump come up and they'd be like, whoa, that's cool, man. That's a great painting. And they, I don't like Trump, but I love that. And it was such a great bridge for conversation. And I was four days in the protest park in Cleveland. And I, the only trouble I had was one guy trying to chew on the corner of the painting, like the print. He literally was nibbling on it, you know, and he was on his face or something. Other oh my than that, goodness. I got, you know, insulted here and there. But most people, they, and especially the liberal world that, they, that sort of controls the art world, they gave great respect to the image because of the painting and because it was a powerful image. They respected it enough to not go any further than that. But at the same time, there is hostility, there is opposition. Even locally, the media is very reluctant to character. They've had eight or nine months to cover this story and they virtually refuse to do it because it's very positive, it's visionary, and it's Trump. And it's everything they don't want. If I had blood coming out of his nose and fangs, you know, <laughs> they'd love it. You know? Right. Well, and of course, 
that there's a reason why the media, the mainstream media, the the media who isn't independent like us, you know, their approval rating is six percent, and that's because when they have a local artist who paints a masterpiece that's been seen all across the country, it's been featured in the Republican National Convention. You're right; that's absolutely insane oh, that they choose totally to stay been, silent on it. And even the local uh, conservative talker, Frank Acom, on a show called Frankly Speaking. He's covered my story and he's been there, but, and I've said to him, it's amazing how this blackout is local. And we live not, it's not, I mean, we live in a town upstate New York where nothing's going on. Elmira is like a ghost town most of the time. And so when something of this nature happens, you'd think just on a level of maybe crediting it with merit and saying, you know what, this is something different and better and it's positive, it's a create, it's a pain. They just will not because it's so positive for Trump that they and it's just they just don't want to cover it so that's the the question is it, it's it's a challenge to those who see the painting i saw it for hours on hours on end i loved it being in that park in cleveland in public square because i watched it happen i saw the power of it where i had a for example one couple of brothers elderly gentlemen come up to the painting they basically threw me off the painting they said get out of here we want a photo with the painting we don't want you in it <laughs> And they stood behind it, but one of them was a Trump supporter, and his brother was not. And he's like, I'm not voting for Trump, I'm not voting for Trump. And then he's looking at the painting, he's standing there staring at it, and he goes, I might vote for Trump after all, just by looking at the painting. It touched him, and that to me was part of like the social experiment, wanting to see how a very diverse public will respond to the painting. And obviously it wasn't this, that they didn't get to see the real thing, but it was, a, it was enough for them to take. Go ahead. I'm it was sorry. about the, it was about a third of the size. Is that right? It's actually a quarter of the size. A quarter of the size. And I remember, I, I saw some of it myself. I would be filming interviews, and the next thing I know, there's three women. Please, please figure out how to work my camera, work the camera. Or there would be, uh, I, I remember, a grandmother and her grandson sitting by it. Okay, when he's not looking here, get a picture of me with the painting. <laughs> uh, really, I, I, want to, I want, you know, people, it, just, it, was, it was just a great experience. And But again, for me as an artist, who's venturing into the political art world, um, you know, I want to see my gift be used to birth vision and give people inspiration. People get very inspired by it. I've shared it with a lot of people who are very discouraged politically. They're very discouraged with the country. They've lost hope. Um, a lot of people, we're having a Tea Party rally here next week. The Tea Party got in touch with me and they at first were again very standoffish because they were supporting Cruz and they didn't want anything to do with what I was doing. Now that that whole thing is over, they called me and said, we're having a rally, we want you to speak at the rally. And I said, well, come and see my space, maybe you want to do it here, I've got a great space. They came down today and they're like, we want to see, we want to have the rally here next week. And so it's a Tea Party rally for Trump in here with this as the backdrop, but I think it's going to be pretty cool. Julian, correct me if I'm wrong, you're, you're not born here initially and you have an interesting story. I was born in London in 1970 and my family moved to southern Spain. 1972 and I grew up in a beautiful idyllic Mediterranean you know paradise in Marbella Spain which is a very beautiful place to live and had the privilege of growing up basically on the beach with you know great weather 95% of the year great food a beautiful culture and a pretty easygoing lifestyle moved to the United States as a sense of calling in 1996 and I, my plan originally was to come to America. I came as a missionary and to go to, Me uh, to, go to California with, to visit a friend, which I did. I was gonna stay there three to six months, work part-time, maybe make a couple of thousand dollars and go to Mexico since I was fluent in Spanish, buy a donkey and cart, fill it with New Testaments and go south into South America and preach the gospel. That's what my, <laughs> my motivation in coming to America. But, you know, God used it to get me here because I didn't have an interest in coming to the States and staying. I really wanted to go and get lost in the Andes Mountains in South America, working with some primitive people. That was my goal. Um, but, you know, how, you know how the joke goes, you know, if you want to make God laugh, you tell him your plans. So uh, my plan was to do that. And um, it turned out, though, that things didn't work out that well in California. And after three months, I was trying since I arrived here to extend my status I was trying to get my legal status because you could travel to the United States with a three month tourist visa from the United Kingdom. I was from Spain, but I had a British passport so I could stay here legally for three months. 
I tried everything possible. I mean, you know, I'd go to lawyers and see how to extend it. And they'd say, well, you can, but you've got to do this, or you've got to pay this. And I was really broke at the time. They mm. offered me, they said, you know, $10,000 and you can buy a wife and get, we can set you up and, and you live with a woman. And after six months, you then do blah, 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 blah. And I was like, forget it. This is ridiculous. I said, I'm not doing that. I, I, hadn't, I hadn't intended to stay longer than three to six months. And I thought I could get an extension. But after three months, I didn't, and I became an illegal alien in this country. I became an unwanted guest who had outstayed his welcome, and it was not a nice feeling. It was something I didn't want. You know, I had, you know, I, I thought, you know, this, there's got to be a better way to do this than this. And yet, my the way things were, I did, I wasn't in a position just to leave the country and come back. Um, I thought I could work it out from the inside, and I stayed. And when I moved back to New York from California, you know, I was, I actually attended seminary out of status, they knew my status, and they said, well, we, we'll let you study, it's not a problem, I could attend seminary, which I did uh, part-time for a couple of years, um, and I was working part-time under the table, and it was just, it was just a really bad feeling, it was no fun, and it. Christian friends that I had used to say, look, Romans 13, you know, you should obey Caesar and submit to Caesar, and you should leave the country and do the right thing, and I was like, you know, you're right, but I just can't right now. I didn't have it in me to leave because I was trying to hold on to what was now this country I'd fallen in love with. And it, I went through a whole story. I fell in love with this wonderful, godly woman. And I could have then got married and sorted out my paperwork that way and got a green card through marriage. But her family was even accusing me, oh, you want to marry our daughter for her green card? Because I was very straightforward. I said, I don't have my status and I'm not someone to try and hide things. Here, right? This is who I am. So I went through all this accusation and I said, you know what, the only way to silence all this garbage is to do the right thing, and that's to leave and to do right to this country and basically say you're sorry and get out. And that's what I did. And I, with my pastor and my fiance, I went to 26 Federal Plaza in New York City and I handed myself in. And that's what I shared with you in, in, in Cleveland. And they stood there looking at me you got to be kidding. <laughs> <laughs> who, who is this yuck? What's he doing? Is he serious? What's he want us to do? Haul him away in chains? <laughs> I know. And I, was, I was like this. I, I just put my, you know, I, I waited for three hours. You go to a building like that, and it's like a massive queue and three hours waiting and up to the whatever floor. And it's going and walking with my arms out like this. And they sort of, like, it was hysterical. So they said, basically, leave. Just leave the country. And um, I then, you know, I, I think I, by that time I'd already booked my flight. I just, I could have just left without saying anything, but I thought it was the right thing to do before God, before my pastor at the time, my, my fiance, and say, look, I want to silence these things, even that your family is saying, do the right thing, show that this is what I want to do. I think it's the, the honorable thing to do. And then I jumped on a plane and I left the country. And it was the hardest six months of my life at that time. It was brutal. I was in love. I didn't want to leave. I, would we ever get married? Technically, they could have stamped my passport at the airport with a no right. return stamp for five to 10 years for our stay. Because they look at your passport and they look at the date of entry and they're like, man, you came in, but you didn't leave. And uh, it, it didn't happen. They took my passport. They opened it up. They looked at it. They looked at me and they folded it up and they gave it back to me. And I was like, whoa, I was like, oh, praise God, I can come back. But I had to go through and go home and fix, you know, get my life ready in order to come back and get married now. And that took six months. And after six months, everything was right. I came back to the United States with a, a visa. Once again. I could have even come on what's called a fiancé visa. But I came again on the same tourist visa. I came and within the time period, I was married and legally married. And everything was done correctly from then forwards. And that's such a testimony now because now with donald trump wanting to bring about legal sanity in our country and to the people that say you know it's oh it's we can't it's like, we can do this it's the right thing to do and it's the right thing to do for people who live in the shadows even to give them dignity for them to go out and come back and say you know if you go out with it with the prospect of coming back and getting working papers because you know 90 percent of the hispanic population are hard-working people and they're, they're great for for the economy okay great let's help them get working papers and i believe that that's what donald trump will do and it's just ridiculous that we live at a time where the laws of our land require that people do this and yet there are people who just want to break give a blanket wash to it all and say no just you know, just to get it all and get, that's a slap in the face to the 
hundreds of thousands of people that are lined up trying to emigrate to the United States legally, it's just wrong. And it's, it's, not, it's, not, neither, it's neither cruel nor racist to require that people simply obey the law of our land. It's just law enforcement. It's just simple and it's straightforward. You know, that's why I like Trump. He's a straightforward guy. He's a pragmatist. It's like, that's the way it should be. Just do it the way it's written and let's get on with the job. And you did it exactly what he says. You know, he says that about the illegal population all the time. They can leave, but then they have to come back legally. And you proved that that is not only possible, but it's possible for a young man who was in the United States for much longer than he was supposed to be here. Probably, I imagine your roots back in Great Britain were few and far in between if you spent all that time in Spain and you still made it happen. Well, that's it, thank God. And I and, and today I can, I really, you know, you really have a sense of I did the right thing. And that's what people need to get, you know, if you want to dignify people, if you want to give a, a people that are hidden in the shadows dignity, you help them do it the right way, and it'll dignify them. It'll give them that. Giving them a carte blanche or just sort of eliminating, that doesn't bring dignity to people. It suddenly just says, oh, we'll just pretend it wasn't. If that's not the way to do it. And so it's neither unreasonable, neither is it racist. It's just righteous, in my opinion, to require that people who have come into this country, outstayed their welcome, or they've come in illegally, they need to turn around and leave and show respect to us. And that way we can say, you know, you show respect to us, will help you come back legally and be part of our country. I'll give you a pathway to citizenship. It took me 20 years, you know, my pathway. I could have got my citizenship earlier on, but once my, my legal residency ran out, then I was in a position to say, you know, I'm not going to spend another six, $700 to renew that. I'm already in love with this country. I want to become a citizen. Now is the time to do it. And I did it. And what was amazing, Tom, is that that process had been going on for a year and a half before I was even in, involved in the painting. And the, uh, the citizenship, green, the, the green light came through September the 17th, 2015. I finished this painting September the 28th, 2015. So right in the midst of me involved in this whole process, I become a citizen and I pledge allegiance to the Constitution and I pledge allegiance to the flag. I swear the oath of allegiance and my life again, once again, has changed because now I'm committed to uphold the values that I love and defend the nation that I love and the laws and constitution of this nation that I love. And that then drives me even more to use my gifts and talents to be in the process and to be part of the solution for our great country. Amazing. What an incredible story. Thank you so much for sharing it with me. Now, I, I teased our viewers about this in the introduction, and I, I think we're going to do some sort of giveaway. Is that right? That's right. I would like to give one of your viewers uh, one of a signed copy of a print of Unafraid and Unashamed. And um, I'm going to sign it for you in front of right here. And that way, however you decide to give it out, whichever person it is, the 10th core or however you do it, go ahead and do that. Okay. And again, that's an opportunity to win a one of a kind, well, it's a print, but a print of a one of a kind, truly magnificent painting that you now know the story of from recently legal immigrant Julian Raven. And Julian, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been a pleasure, and I know the viewers have enjoyed it. Well, thank you, Tom. It's been a pleasure for me also. And uh, together, we the people, we've got lots of work to do, and this is just another stage in that process. That's right. All right, this is Tom Papper for The Honest Media. We'll be back next time. <laughs>